And good morning, sisters, friends, and for mothers, um, because we have like very tight time schedule. So I just begin. Okay. The first record of photography in China dates back to 1842, marking the arrival of this visual technology in China alongside colonial expansion. However, for a long period of time, photography associated only with political propaganda of the country. It's not until the emergence of a new and radical landscape in Chinese contemporary art, the so-called avant-garde art movement in the 1980s, brought new life into photography and redefined it as a creative art form. It's the watershed period when Western contemporary art flooded China, leaving a profound influence on a new generation of artists. However, when I started my initial research from Wu Hong's book, Zooming in Histories of Photography in China, I immediately noticed the critical absence, the absence of famous photographers. In this history of both Chinese photography and modernity, women are only visible as visual subjects confronting the patriarchal gaze. In retrospect, it's heartrending and regrettable that little her stories of female artists and female photographers are forged, celebrated, researched, or received their attention due. The situation persists as I strive to find more information and research about contemporary female photographers that I am interested in. The group is still considerably marginalized. There lacks both survey work and case studies to acknowledge, explore, and interpret photographs by those brilliant women photographers. So my study and presentation aim to create an alternative space in which a new discussion of her stories can be initiated. Three women photographers that I have selected represent a new generation. Although they do not explicitly claim their works as feminist, there are crucial feminist awareness and reflections. They all explore womanhood, femininity, body, and particularly identity in an alternative, candid, and caring way. Annie Lai claims herself as a Chinese fashion photographer. She was born in New Zealand, raised in China, and has been now based in London since 2014. In 2018, she took the first photograph for her personal series, In Between. The initial drive to produce this ongoing series was for Annie to find an outlet to heal herself. In that year, she visited her childhood home in China for the last time. Later, as she recounts, the idea of home was suddenly deprived from me, and the feeling of loss was so overwhelming. Her personal crisis and struggles living in a foreign society are associated with language barriers, visa issues, and invisible barrier when forging connections with other people. Annie then talked with her Chinese friends who share the similar background. She realized they are in the same awkward position that they are emotionally rooted in Chinese culture while entering a new environment when they were just about to be aware of the notions of identity, culture, and representation. Here I quote, we can't return to where we started, yet we are really far away from fully embracing this new society. So Annie started shooting portraits for her friends in their rented flat in London. As the subjects and as friends of Annie, six women have this double row of resonating each other. The shooting space is also a deliberate decision. On one hand, Annie wants her female friends to feel relaxed in front of the camera. So their own temporary home became the most ideal place where all these moments were captured. On the other hand, Annie was contemplating to what degree a confined physical space can be seen as home. That's why we now see diverse household stuff and decorations in the series. They are personal, intimate, authentic, mirroring the real unsettled states of life. These two photographs feature Xiao Qiao, respectively, in 2020 and a year later. She is a Chinese girl who came to London to study, but found her life in the UK full of uncertainties and unstable fleeting connections. She says, living in the UK is more like a transition where farewells are inevitable. It's hard to have deep conversations when you have grown up with totally different memories. Annie sensitively made this contrast, shooting Xiao Qiao's portraits in two opposite poses. 
As audiences, we don't know if they were shot in the same apartment. There seems to be a distance and loss of time between us and two women. Their conversations before photographing were only receivable within that particular space. While Annie's work indeed reserved the passage of time, the changes happened to two women during the pandemic and the subtle connection which has always been floating there between the two. Photography allows the existence of this renaissance and it further confirms and reanimates it. We can observe a clear style of Annie's portrait series. They are caring and respectful from a female gaze. There is minimal styling or intervention from Annie. The camera has its proper distance to freeze female bodies at ease, not far so we can imagine we are in the scene, witnessing a real life instant at that moment. It's not too close either to intrude the tranquil, secure and transparent connection. It's interesting that relationship between Annie and her subjects, between self and others, are mutual, quite fluid and changing over time. As Wen Chu here the model says, I was curious to see her portraits of me and my self-relation through her gaze. So they gaze each other having a tacit understanding with each other. In my research, I refer to diaspora studies to understand how female photographers like Annie and women in her photographs are mounted to a nuanced, inexplicable applicable position of cultural identities in diaspora. Since the 1990s, diaspora scholars and feminist researchers have argued that the concept of diasporic communities is broader than only considering ethnicity or nationality. It should be understood as imagined cultural ide and identity collectives. And it means recognizing and negotiating the boundaries between homogeneity and heterogeneity. Annie's photographing practice demonstrates that identity is always in progress, it's never complete. Her whole process of producing photographs from reaching out to women she could resonate with, to building connections, and chanting deeply and widely to final shooting, encourage us to think about cultural identity in two different ways as proposed by Hausstudt in Cultural Identity, identity and a Diaspora. The first view sees cultural identity as one shared culture, a, a sort of collective that one true self hiding inside the many other. This shared experience and common cultural codes drive Annie to initiate, observe, and connect with other women who have similar diasporic ex experience. While the second view of cultural identity recognizes the matter of becoming along with of being, it's not an essence, but a positioning, a series of deep and significant differences that are happening, shaping and constructing. And his portraits clearly acknowledge these differences when these women in photographs taking in charge, they are the one to set the boundary, lead the construction and foreground the intersubjectivity between photographer and individuals being photographed. Undoubtedly, Annie's approach of photographing is not only caring, but also supportive and empowering. Alongside her tender mixture palette of soft tones, there is also empowered female bodies, gaze, and forms. We can see the fragility of womanhood, particularly of women in diaspora, but more importantly, there is resilience to the unsettled and precarious environment. There is the tenacious seek for benignness and a developing community of temporary residents who live in the in-between space. Similarly, I want to introduce Luo Yang, who has been for a decade framing femininity with raw and intimate texture in China. Luo Yang was born in 1984 in Shenyang, the northeastern part of China. Now she lives and works in Beijing and Shanghai. Initially trained as a graphic designer in college, Luo Yang instead decided to pursue her interest and talent in photography. While she was still at school, she began photographing the young women around her of her generation. The series um, Girls was started in two, 2007 when Luoyang was at the age of 23. Over the course of several years, Luoyang followed a hundred women, including her friends at the beginning, recording changes to their bodies and lives. 
Later, this monumental series over a decade reflects the shifting mindset on ideas of femininity and identity in China that deviates from Western perception of China. Heavy lipsticks, neon hair, shaved hair, bizarre clothes, smudged makeup, candid nudity, confusing age and young womanhood. They belong to a part of contemporary China that is far too rarely taken note of in other parts of the world. There are many traditional definitions and limits for women in this country. So does stereotypes and patriarchal narratives. However, Luoyang's girls embody the opposite. They are abnormal alien if reading through a traditional and conclusive eye, where we can sense the raw beauty and power, the tension that has great diversity among those different individualities. These women in photographs are sincere, independent, self-aware, while having similar confusions about family, about culture and society. There is no clear boundary between their tenacity and vulnerability, confidence and loss, hidden and blatant. Like Annie's practice, Luoyang's approach to unveil this uncelebrated femininity is also intimate. For example, Luoyang lived together with the girl named Carmen, which is on the, in the right picture. They lived in a flooded small town for a week. They spent every day to talk, or sharing poems, or dying here, or taking photos. Luoyang has developed a sensitive visual style in the series, aiming to explore and present diverse femininity within her models. She says, I portray women as they are and present what I have seen in them. This private inside of them which is strong, wild, sad, lonely, free, independent, and brave. Unlike any series that many happened in subjects temporary habitants or personal apartments, Luoyang's series involved more sorts of urban space. For, for example, on the motorway, on the roof, in front of traffic, in a taxi, etc. Figures and urban space are interweaving, blurring the border of personal life and social life. This visible interaction with social space is quite important to understand women in Luoyang series, as they do not belong to the mainstream culture. Some of them struggle in the frustrating frustration of being excluded and alienated by family and society. They depart from the most traditional and dominant expectation on women imposed by a collective and a patriarchal society. Therefore, when I was doing my research, I thought of the connection between this series and Pharaoh's study from a feminist perspective. Pharaoh often refers to a non-human animal that has escaped from captivity or domestication. We often tend to put animals into one of two kinds, either domesticated or wild. However, this dualism or binary classification does not apply to those non-domesticated animals who live in urban space. So if we transfer this idea to Luoyang series and to her subjects, we find they are interestingly relevant. If there is any similarity among those young women captured by Luoyang, I would say they share this feral identity. They have gone feral because they es escaped various situations of captivity, domination, and abuse to live liminal lives in urban spaces. On the other hand, Luoyang's photograph uh, recorded and celebrated the freedom and independence of this feral woman from a certain degree of social control. While these works also frankly present their vulnerability because of choosing ferality and being the avant-garde of their generation. The artist and photographer Liao Yijun or Pixie Liao is also experimenting with the possibilities of portraiture and photography in a subversive way. She was born and raised in Shanghai and now resides in New York. Her long-term project experimental relationship, which began in 2017 and still ongoing, depicts modern partnership and dynamics of gender roles, challenging and reversing male gaze and power relations and heterosexuality. <coughs> Pixie met her current partner, Moro, a Japanese musician five years her junior, and 2006, when she was a uh, photography student at the University of Memphis, and one year later she, bega she began the series. As she claimed in her statement, as a woman brought up in China, I used to think I could only love someone who is older and more mature than me, who can be my protector and mentor. Then I met my current boyfriend. 
Since he's five years younger than me, I felt that the whole concept of relationships changed all the way around. I became a person who has more authority and power. The acknowledgement of Pixie's series aligned with broader societal issues such as migration and feminist movements. In the early phase of displaying those works, and especially in the US, Pixie, as an Asian minority, encountered comments like, hey, here is this Asian couple doing Asian things. People didn't relate at all. After the first exposure of global Me Too movement and people paid more attention to female voices, Pixie found audiences started to understand her works and she got more media representation. This ongoing project over a decade is never normative. In the early works of this series, Pixie appeared in a position of domination. It was her deploying the female gaze and exerting power over Mora, the male model. Pixie says, I feel that there is this kind of secret desire within a woman. It may be her expectation of power and her ambition for dominant position. So in the process of uh, photographing the series, she satisfies her own desires and reclaims the power of dominance. However, as the couple grew older and the relationship developed, the project involved to include wider topics and reflections derived from Pixie's daily observation and contemplation. Violence, death, historical complexity between China and Japan, as Pixie describes their connection as a love-hate relationship. For example, in the work Intertwined on the right, gra grasping the shutter line appears as the composition center. Pixie ties the shutter lines around their necks. They are naked, gazing each other. They are, there are desire, tension, and more sophisticated power dynamics always connecting Pixie and Moro. The picture on this, on this slide was featured in Pixie's um, first museum solo show at Photographiska in New York in 2021, along with the boiling public opinion stirred by the surging hate crimes against Asian Americans in the US. The show implies not only the empowerment of women, the modern version of Psyche and Cupid, but also the recognition gained by artists who have Asian heritage. Your gaze belongs to me. It's the title of the show and the title of Pixie's one work. In an interview early this year, Pixie admits that she has never been exposed, exposed to feminism in her upbringing. She continued to dig into her subconscious. Here I quote, perhaps my subconscious is feminist. There are many parts of my work that are self-awakening and there are many similarities with feminism. This self-awareness starts from my personal experience. Here it's Worth to mention that many Chinese origin artists and uh, photographers denied themselves as feminists in public, many because they face strict censorship and there is always political risk related with the term. Pixie's creation is driven by her true feelings, her awakening moments, and interestingly, she creates in a way with a lot of fantasy and humor especially when touching the topics of poetry, love, relationship, power dynamics, and sexuality. Pixie uses photos to recreate the image in her imagination. She says that photography has a way to mix her imagination and reality. It creates a parallel universe where she and her partner may explore different possibilities of relationship. So we witness in her later works in the series less dominance and submission, but more collaboration, fantasy, and careness. She takes humor very seriously. She says, when I'm humored, I can reveal my true self. Talking back to the theme of my study, connect the hidden self with anonymous others. I think Pixie's words could be a perfect conclusion. I'm sure I'm not the only one who things like this. Maybe there are some people out there who, like when I was young, think of themselves as weirdos and they would think, oh, that's similar to what I think. I'm not alone. We are not alone. Finally, I want to refer to the title of her work, also on this slide. We'll come to the gates of a new era. I think it's a new era when Chinese women photographers are inspired by their personal experience related to identity, love, life, and social engagement. It's a new era when women photographers, women in photographs, and audiences find connections in the terrain of feminism. 
younger generations of Chinese women photographers, and so do we as witness, though still constrained by the country's harsh censorship on visuals and wording, we could be empowered by these connections created by diverse identities. Thank you, and I want to appreciate, uh, I really appreciate the Fast Forward team and the Momus of having, this, um, having me at this conference. I really enjoy it, and the city as well. Thank you. Thank you so much.